we're going to we're going to go back into the Old Testament and learn from the Israelites and their messianic expectation part 7 Turn your Bibles to Genesis chapter 22 to a very familiar story. Look at verse 1. Well, at least a very familiar story to many of us. Some people have never heard this story before. And it came to pass after these things that God did try Abraham. He tested Abraham. God does not tempt anybody. But the word tempt here in the old King James means to try, to test, and uh, see whether or not he is going to be faithful and by the way, dear Christian friends, God is still doing that today with you and with me, whether you like it or not. Uh, that God did tempt Abraham, try Abraham, test Abraham, and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here I am. And he said, Take now thy son thine only son Isaac and by the way I, I still believe that God speaks to the hearts of people today uh, not in an audible fashion <clears throat> in fact I know God speaks to the hearts of people some of us would not be where we are today if it had not been for God speaking to our hearts and making some things very clear to us. I cannot explain it to you. Uh, no doubt it's through the Holy Spirit. And I'm talking about people who are saved. I, I believe that you hear the still small voice of God even today. Maybe not like Abraham did because you're not Abraham and I'm not Abraham. But I believe God speaks to the hearts of people even today. And I hope that God will speak to your heart today. Some of you are not letting God speak to your heart because you are pharisaically proud. You are stubborn. You are rebellious. You've got your mind made up to be mean as hell. And God can't get in there to speak to you. And so some of you, I'm, I fear that some Christians have not, and even preachers have not heard from God in years. But it is important that God speaks to you and to your heart. It's, it is a mystery. I cannot explain it to you, but I'm here to tell you God will speak to you, especially when you're praying to Him. And He said, Take now thy son, thine only son, Isaac, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering, and I want you to notice this, upon one of the mountains which I will tell thee of. See, you must understand that God he has a way of not telling you all, all of the details. You just go do this right here. This is your first step. And then I'll tell you which mountain I want you to do this on. And that's just how it's going to be throughout life. I know you want to know everything because you want to know everything. But God does not work that way. And Abraham rose up early in the morning. He was not dilatory. You know how we are when we don't want to do something, especially when we don't know all the details. We don't know uh, how it's going to work out, and we really don't even know where we're going. We don't even know which mountain to choose. <laughs> we move kind of slow. We don't like, we, we just kind of uh, take our time. 
But Abraham got up early in the morning and saddled his ass. Now some of you have a problem with that word ass because we have messed up the word ass, not God. The ass is still an ass. Our minds are corrupt. We think stupidly. There's nothing wrong with the word. An ass is still an ass. Today, but we have, you know, with our wicked hearts and minds, have uh, changed the meaning of things because we're wicked as hell. Anyway, and took two of his young men with him, and Isaac his son, and claved the wood for the burnt offering, and rose up and went unto the place of which God had told him. You can just imagine what's starting to form in Isaac's mind. And then on the third day Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said unto his young men, Abide ye here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship, and come again to you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it upon Isaac, his son. And he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and they went both of them together. Abraham was somebody. And Isaac spake unto Abraham his father and said, my father, he was a smart kid, like, like most children are smart. They pick up quickly, and they, if they don't see certain things, they begin to ask questions. And, they, they, and, and, if, and if it's a good kid like this kid, they don't get an attitude. They don't start drawing back, to, oh, I'm running back. I'm going to find Syria. Well, somebody, <laughs> I don't see a lamb. I don't see a lamb, man. You don't lay, you don't lay this wood on me. You got, you got the fire in your hand. <laughs> Woo! Mm. No, no, no. You know, I kids, I start walking back like this right here. They're all swinging. <laughs> Woo! Mm -mm -mm. Smart kid. What's up? What's up, Bob? <laughs> Where's your animal at? I've seen your sacrifice before. We've always had an a animal with us. And Isaac spake unto Abraham his father and said, My father. What's up? And he said, Here am I, my son. <laughs> right here. Woo, boy, I tell you. Mm -mm -mm. Lord, help me. <laughs> oh, my soul. Yeah, uh, he's a here, my, my son, yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Woo. And he said, Behold the fire. <laughs> Behold the fire. <laughs> yeah, I know Abraham was, I know all these things, son. And the wood. <laughs> But where is the lamb, Bops, for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, and he came back quick, but he came back better than most fathers would have come back. And Abraham said, my son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went both of them together. Thank God for Isaac. That's who we're going to talk about a little bit tonight. If I get to it, 
he submitted to his father, and they walked together. Unlike a rebellious son who does not want to walk together with his father. You want to walk way over there? <laughs> want to walk in a full direction? <laughs> want to turn back and face the wall? And they came to the place which God had told him of, and Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order. Abraham was faithful. And bound Isaac. Now, he, now Isaac knew something was up at that point. There was no secret as to what was going on. Isaac humbly submitted to his father to stay put on the altar. Most children would have been trying to get off that altar, rolling off the altar, knocking things down, kicking and screaming, but not Isaac. And laid the wood in order and bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar upon the wood. Notice Isaac's not saying a mumbling word. Just like Jesus when they laid him on the cross. And Abraham, Abraham was not messing around. Abraham was going to be faithful and obedient to God. And Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. And he, he, he did not hesitate. He did not hesitate. He staggered not. And the angel, thank God for the angel coming in. I know Isaac said, whew, angel, good to see you. Good to see you, buddy. And the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am I, Abraham. He had to call Abraham twice. Abraham was serious. He was going to do what God told him to do. Abraham had learned not to be disobedient to God. And you're going to see this is the main purpose as to why God was testing him. And God, by the way, is testing you to see whether or not you're going to be obedient, whether or not you fear God. And he said, Lay not thine hand upon the lad, your child, neither do thou anything unto him, for now I know that thou fearest God seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. Now listen, listen to me, people. You can't make this up. You can't make a story up like this. This is real. This is, this is what happened. This is a true account. Three religions, three major religions, look back to this man named Abraham. Something happened. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram, and he was probably smiling, no doubt, and offered him up for a burnt offering in the steed of his son. And Abraham called the name of that place, Jehovah Jireh, as it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord it shall be seen. And God did all of this, my dear friends, knowing that he was going to give up his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, as the Lamb of God, to take away the sins of the world. Let's pray. Holy Father God, we praise you and we thank you for allowing us to see another beautiful Saturday where we are. We pray for the people who are hurting in Missouri and in Oklahoma, suffering with floods, tornadoes, and uh, losing of loss, losing of uh, family members, and losing of property. Lord, comfort them as only you can, and those who are not saved, help them to get saved. And Lord, send forth laborers into the field for the harvest, the whited harvest, and lead folks, including us, Lord, lead these folks to Christ. Have mercy and grace upon such wretched people as we are, and for Jesus Christ's sake, forgive us of our sins, our failures, and our faults, as we from our hearts, by your grace, forgive those who have sinned against us. 
crush and crucify, Lord, our flesh afresh and anew, and fill us afresh and anew with the fullness and the power, the unction and the anointing, the fruit and the liberty, the Lord of your Holy Spirit. And by the power and might of your Holy Spirit, have your holy word to go forth to comfort the saints, to remind them of the rapture of the church, the second coming of Christ, and uh, Lord, uh, most importantly, that other people who don't know you as Savior would come to know you as Savior. Uh, Lord, open blinded eyes and unstop deaf ears, and give me your strength to proclaim the gospel. Grant me your unction and the power of your Holy Spirit to do so. Glorify your holy name, and lift up your holy Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, for it is in his holy name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. How to hope. How to hope. The lessons from the Israelites, the Jews, and their messianic expectation many years ago we can learn from them this is part seven dr alan p ross said to fear god means to reverence him to respect him as sovereign to not question him to not doubt him to trust him implicitly and obey him without question this reveals the greatness of Abraham's faith. Remember now, he was not hesitant. Even God pointed out how that Abraham loved his only son, <clears throat> very much so, as all decent parents do there are some sick parents who don't love their children there's something wrong and I don't care what kind of upbringing they had if you don't love your own children you don't have natural affection for your own children there's something desperately wrong if you can't say I love you to your own child you are a sick person and Abraham loved his son Isaac very much so probably I don't know the tears were flowing a little bit while they were marching up the mountain can you imagine that walk what a walk he was willing to obey God by sacrificing his only son his miracle son by the way it also reveals the greatness of Isaac's faith in submission. What a child, what a young lad, what a young man. He is the wish of all parents. Smart, because he knew what was going on before he got to the mountain. He picked up on what was happening. It's wonderful to have a smart child, and uh, but it's also wonderful for that child to be so smart that they understand the principle of submission and obedience and having the right kind of heart and attitude, no matter how bad the situation is. And this is very bad for him <clears throat> and for Abraham. Isaac probably noticed the emotions welling up in Abraham's spirit and face. I don't know. But this was not a fun day. He had everything in the world to live for, but willingly followed his father's words, believing that God would provide a lamb, In the quote. Ladies and gentlemen, as you know, a few weeks back, 
before we had uh, uh, a special holiday with Easter and so many other things took place. We looked at this account of Abraham being commanded by God to sacrifice his son. And the lessons that we can learn from his response to this discouraging and harrowing test as we anticipate the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. We can learn from the Jews. We can learn from the Israelites, and we should. We can learn from the Old Testament. I strongly encourage you that you keep a whole Bible, the Old Testament and the New Testament. Our Christian faith, regardless of what some theologians are saying today, is based upon the Old Testament and what God did with the Israelites. And always remember, Jesus Christ is a Jew. Your Savior is a Jewish carpenter. We saw a few weeks ago the importance of num number one, trusting God even when we don't understand. How about it, dear Christian friend? Are you there? I just heard today that many millennials, many young people, I'm just, I'm just blown away at, at, at people just openly saying today, I mean, I appreciate the honesty, I appreciate the transparency very much, so, but young people, people who got it, some who have it made, some even rich people are saying, I, I, I have a real problem with anxiety and worry and uh, feeling depressed and defeated. Many of them are claim to be Christians or brought up in the church, many. And these things are not so to be. So number one, we saw trusting God even when we don't understand. Are you doing that, dear Christian friend? Why are you so anxious? Why are you so worried? Why are you fretting so much? What's wrong? Oftentimes, it is sin in your own life. And one of the key sins is that you don't fear God, you don't respect God, you don't reverence God, you really don't want to have anything to do with God because you want to keep it human about you and what you can do and that therein lies your problem that's why you're fretting and you're so filled with anxiety and worry you're trying to do life this life this thing as Prince called it this thing called life by yourself on your own you didn't create this life you didn't create your life who do you think you are trying to live this life without God that's foolishness and that's why you're down in the dumps all of the time. You're constantly trying to fake people out with your Instagram account, your Facebook account. Many people have come to the conclusion that 90% of social media is nothing but a lie. Drawn up by people living in quiet desperation trying to impress others with nothing. See, when you're at peace and you are content, you don't have to try to make people think you're happy. Can somebody say amen? Constantly trying. I mean, people are falling off cliffs, off of buildings and everything else, trying to take a picture so they can send to the, their few little friends and most of them are not even going to look at it and care less. Dying. Trying to show people how wonderful your life is, how happy you are, and you're depressed. The, the fact that you are doing that, it lets us know that you are 
are depressed and defeated and sad and lonely because you want attention. It is so bad today, ladies and gentlemen, this is so sick. And I, I just feel so sorry for people. It's so bad today that people are taking pictures of the of their the, their depressed selves inside on side, uh, inside the, their, their house on their own bed in their little sweatpants or whatever, and then sending it to a social media guru who can take a wonderful who have who has wonderful background pictures to put them plant them in front of these background pictures all over the world. For example, a person could be sitting in uh, Podunk, Kansas in his bedroom or her bedroom, send his picture taken of himself in the picture uh, in front of the Taj Mahal. And, they, and they, they, they will lie and take that picture and send it to all their little few friends and, 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 and oh, look at, look at Bobby. He's at the Taj Mahal. Why can't I go to the Taj Mahal? Then, then they kind of, oh, that's beautiful picture, Bobby. He's sitting on his bed, depressed, defeated. It's disgusting. It's sad. Not, but not, not only that. It gets worse. There's an industry of scenes. People are building scenery all across the United States. One place has a candy scenery, where it's just a big, you know, they, they built some kind of little tent or whatever, and it's just rooms of uh, candy uh, pictures and, you know, for backgrounds. And, and, and the lady asked him, so what, why did y'all build this? So people can come in here and take a very interesting selfie and send it out to their friends. I said, are you kidding me? Look at me, I'm in the candy shop. Are you kidding me? It is so sad. Trying to fake happiness when you're filled with anxiety and worry and fretting. Number two, obeying God despite what others might say. Are you doing that? Most people follow the crowd. Most Christians who know right and know to do right, they don't convince others to follow them and follow the Lord. They follow others and the devil. And number three, following God even when we do not feel like it. How about it? It's called Christian maturity. When you start walking with God even when you may not feel like it. And, and, and in fact, may like feel, you, you may feel like doing something else. But there is another person in this wonderful story, true story, true account, whom we can learn from as well. His name is Isaac. Isaac must have become concerned as he and his father neared the end of a three-day journey to sacrifice to Abraham's God and no animal had yet made an appearance and he left the ass the donkey with his two uh, body men my father he said behold the fire and the wood but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Abraham responds, My son, God will provide himself a lamb. God will provide himself a lamb. What a prophetic word for a burnt offering. This is the only verbal exchange between the two that is reported to us. Dr. J.P. Lang and Philip Schaff write in their fine commentary on Genesis, Isaac knew that a sacrificial animal belonged to the sacrifice. The answer of the father, trembling anew at the question of his beloved child, 
appears to intimate that he held the entrance of a new revelation at the decisive moment to be possible. Until this occurs, he must truly obey according to his previous view and purpose. The terms of address, my father, my son. The few weighty and richly significant words mark the difficulty of the whole course for Abraham. As I said to you all earlier, this was some trip. Can you imagine taking such a trip yourself? And then they go on to say, and, pre and present in so uh, much clearer a light the unwavering steadfastness of his readiness to make the offering. Nothing is said of any agitation, of any resistance or complaint on the part of Isaac and really of Abraham. It is clear that he is thus described as the willing sacrificial lamb, end of quote. What can we learn from Isaac's example? What can you and I learn from Isaac's example? What can we take away for our lives today as we live in expectation of the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ? What can we learn from our brothers in the Old Testament? I have three points tonight. I doubt if I'll be able to get to all three of them. First, we must learn to expect to bear burdens. Amen, somebody. Some of you have been slipped a mickey regarding the Christian life. You have been bamboozled. And sadly, you have run amok. Because you have believed a prosperity gospel lie that tells you everything is supposed to go your way. You're not supposed to have any problems. You're not supposed to have any troubles. You're supposed to be rich, the head and not the tail, and you ought to be driving a Bentley, and living in a big fine house on Pork Chop Hill where nothing breaks down. The water heater never uh, falls apart. Your car always runs well. Your children never get sick. Your wife never dies. And you have believed that foolishness and that lie. And that's one of the reasons why you're so depressed and you're so defeated and you're so sad. Because that's a lie, people. You have been duped. And here's what I will say to you. If you're having tribulation, you are probably born again, saved, pleasing in the sight of God, and doing great work for the Lord. If you're loved by the world and everything supposedly is going your way, you're probably lost and on your way to hell. Because in this life, Jesus said, you shall have tribulation be of good cheer. It's not going to be pretty. It's not going to be wonderful all of the time. It's just not. And the more you are committed to obeying God, like Abraham was, the more trouble you're going to have, the more enemies you're going to have. That's just the way it is, dear friends. That's how it was for Jesus, and that's how it was for all of the saints. <clears throat> you don't find these prosperity gospel saints in the Bible. Nowhere, in the Old Testament or in the New Testament. Even if they had money, they had problems, they had trouble. Ask Job, ask David, ask Abraham. So first, dear friends, we must learn to expect to bear burdens in this life. Isaac bearing the wood on his back to the place of sacrifice is a foreshadowing of Jesus bearing his cross 
to God's offer. But Jesus' burden bearing does not mean that we who have benefited from his sacrifice will lie on beds of ease. No, 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 dear friend. We must take up our cross and follow Christ. In fact, Jesus told us, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. We must be willing to bear our burdens just as Isaac was willing to bear his. How about it, dear Christian friend? Are you bearing your burdens? Are you bearing your cross? If you're following Christ, you have a cross to bear. And you will bear it. And it's not going to be cute. It's not going to be funny. It's not going to be fun. It's not going to always be a grand old time. So many Christians today are disillusioned because they want so badly the Christian life to be a bed of ease. And it is not. It is a life of crucifix crucifixion. A life of dying daily to self and to the world and what you want. A life of trouble on the left and on the right. And I would love to preach on but I'm going to close it at that first point. Let's stand for prayer. Holy Father God, we pray in the holy name of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord help your Christian children and your believers in Christ. The Lord, to get back to the old landmarks. We used to hear a whole lot about back in the day how that you were a jealous God. We don't hear that anymore. We used to hear a whole lot back in those old days about fearing God and respecting God, respecting you. We don't hear that anymore, hardly. Lord, we used to hear about bearing our cross before the advent of the so-called the so-called prosperity gospel we don't hear too much about cross bearing today Lord so many people have been slipped a mickey so many people have been bamboozled and deceived Thank you, Lord, for the remnant that still stands strong on your word, who still serve you even though, Lord, they are not rich, never have been rich, and never will be rich. They will die poor. Many will die in debt. And Holy Father God, we pray that your Holy Spirit would draw those who are out in the cold, uh, stuck out there, stranded out there in the prosperity gospel land, and bring them on in, those who are truly born again, who got caught up in the lie. Bring them on back, Lord, to your Holy Word and to Bible-believing churches, and uh, resume suffering with the saints. in bearing one another's burdens. Forgive us, Lord, of our sins, of forsaking you. Forgive us, Lord, of our sins of believing a lie, getting caught up in worldly religion, and not sticking by the stuff, not hanging in there with the old landmarks that we learned so long ago. And help us to confess our sins and help us to repent. 
help us to help people who are telling that lie to stop telling that lie <clears throat> because they know it's not true from their own lives their own families are in shambles because they believe the lie themselves and we thank you for those who are coming out and telling the truth Lord reclaim your true Christian people and bring them back into the fold. Revive us again and help us, Lord, to do your work and will and to do it gladly, cheerfully, and joyfully, whether we get any of the worldly uh, goods down here. In Jesus Christ's name we pray for our sake. Amen. You may be seated, dear friend. Now, if you are with us on this Saturday evening and you have never trusted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I urge you strongly to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ because he is coming again and you do not want to be left behind. Here is how you can place your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ for your salvation from sin and from the consequences of sin, which is eternal hell. First, accept the fact, dear friend, that you are a sinner and that you have broken God's laws. The Bible says in Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Everybody from the Pope on down has failed God. Second, accept the fact that there is a penalty for sin. The Bible states in Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death. We die physically. You're going to die. I'm going to die. Everybody is going to die. If we live long enough, we die physically because of S. I in sin. You may not like to hear that, but that's the truth. Our bodies go to the grave or are thrown into the sea. Our soul goes to hell to burn forever, to be tormented forever, to hear gnashing of teeth and weeping and wailing throughout eternity. I say it throughout eternity, if we have never trusted Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, who has taken away the sins of the world as our Lord and Savior. And hell is a real place. Jesus Christ himself preached on it repeatedly. He preached on it more than anybody in the Bible. Jesus Christ preached on hell more than he did about heaven. Not because he hates us, but because he loves us. He wants us to be saved from hell. He wants us to know. He wants to warn us about hell. That we would not go there so that we can go to heaven to be with God. Because God loves us and he wants us to be there with him. So accept the fact right now that you are on the road to hell as I speak. You don't have to do anything else. If you have never trusted Christ as Savior, you don't have to do anything else. If you died right now, you would go straight to hell. Jesus Christ said in Matthew 10, 28, And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Hell is a very real place. Hell is a sad place, and to me the saddest aspect of hell is that once you are behind the gates of hell, you can't get out. There's no more gospel, no more grace, no more salvation is over. So don't go to hell. You don't have to go to hell. Hell is bad news, but I have some good news for you. Jesus Christ said himself in John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. 
and just believe in your heart in the Lord Jesus Christ that he died for your sins was buried and rose from the dead by the power of God for you so that you can live forever with him pray and ask him to come into your heart to save your soul today and he will save your soul there's no doubt about it Romans 10 9 and 13 says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shall believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead thou you shall be saved for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved saved from what saved from hell saved to what saved to heaven so dear friend believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved pray and ask him to save your soul and he will save you and I'll be glad to lead you in what is called the sinner's prayer I prayed it over 40 years ago and uh, you can pray it tonight someone led me in prayer because I didn't know what to pray and I got saved that night December the 19th 1979 and tonight can be your night follow me in prayer repeat after me phrase by phrase and mean it from your heart and I guarantee you based upon the Word of God God will save your soul Holy Father God Holy Father God I acknowledge that I am a sinner that I have done evil in your sight. I have broken your Ten Commandments. For Jesus Christ's sake, please forgive me of all of my sins. My lying, my stealing, my dishonesty, my dis honoring my parents taking your holy name in vain lusting after people and things for Jesus Christ's sake please forgive me of all of my sins as I now believe with all of my heart in the Lord Jesus Christ that he suffered and bled and died on the cross for my sins as the Lamb of God who took away the sins of the entire world that he was buried and that he rose on the third day Lord Jesus please come into my heart and save my soul and change my life fill me with your Holy Spirit for I receive you as my Savior and help me to repent of all of my sins and turn from my evil ways and to follow you in the new life. In Jesus Christ's name I pray and for his sake. Amen. Dear friend of mine, if you just trusted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, Today, and you prayed that prayer with me and you meant it from your heart I declare to you that based upon the Word of God you are now saved from hell and you're on your way to heaven welcome to the family of God to the beloved family congratulations on doing the most important thing in life and that is believing on the Lord Jesus Christ receiving Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior for more information to help you grow in your newfound faith in Christ, please go to GospelLightSociety.com and read my pamphlet titled, What to Do After You Enter Through the Door. Jesus Christ said in John 10, 9, I am the door by me. If any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. Until next time, my beloved, God loves you, we love you, and may God bless you. Real good is my prayer.